customarily with our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, action on the agenda. Dr. Schreiger, do you know of any changes to our agenda? There are no changes to tonight's agenda. You. Thank you. I would entertain a motion to approve it as it sits in front of you. So moved. Second. So we'll go Karen moved and Tom second. And motion to approve the agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, we go action on the minutes. You have those distributed. There are meeting minutes from 610 and there are special meeting minutes from 617. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from 610 and 617 as presented. I'll second. Motion from Diamond, seconded by Tom, to approve the minutes as distributed to you from both meetings. Regular meeting of 610, special meeting of 617. Discussion? Everybody's okay. All in favor of approving the minutes as distributed, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The minutes are approved as they are distributed. Action on the vouchers. Yes, Joe. I'd like to make a motion to approve $349,515.18 and 82 cents as presented. I'll second that motion. Motion from Mike, seconded by Tom. Uh, any discussion? I have a few questions, just more for clarification than anything. Um, on page one, um, towards the bottom, and starting at page two, it looks like there is a uniform purchase for the uh, 2019 MREC, excuse me, MREC uh, baseball softball season. And I guess my question is, it looks like there's about four or five entries. Um, that have the same description and at the same date. And I'm just kind of curious um, why they were separated out. I mean, were they all for different things? That I do not know. I do not know specifically, um, but my guess is it'd be for different, potentially different sports, but I will, the softball, baseball, baseball might be different teams, baseball. might be different levels. Um, but I can uh, find out and have that sent out okay. to the board as to what it, why it was broken up like that. Okay. Yeah, just kind of curious. Um, then the other one, uh, the NEOLA annual policy key. Um, this is more just because I don't know and I'm, I'm uh, kind of curious. Um, how much do we pay for our, our annual fee for NEOLA um, to, to have that service? Is it uh, a yearly fee or is it a uh, um, monthly fee? It's a semi-annual fee, and that's for the, the service to have the policies, uh, the, the updates sent to us. Okay. So we get it sent uh, to in the summertime and in the wintertime. And uh, that's the fee for the, the updates um, that's, that that's we need to approve. First half, right? First half fee? Uh, I, I'm not sure if it's the first or second half of this year. That doesn't okay. start. Uh, it's the June and December are the updates. I'm not sure if this is payment number two, I think it is. Okay. Yeah, I was just but the fiscal year. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think I just have two more here. Um, is um, Mr. Shanks here? Hey, hey, how's it going? Hey, uh, I just actually I'm going to ask this question because I'm connecting dots. Um, so it looks like we have a um, faulty door, and a lot of uh, uh, payments to them. That would be all the doors that you had on your um, bill or your capital improvement plan, like the 14 exterior doors here. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And the, that. those are those are payments for the doors that we were, were completed at the north at north side, part yep. of the DOJ round two grant, and that's an invoice per entry, so an invoice yep. per door, right? That was installed. Okay, so so I can like map that to your capital improvement plan that you gave in November where you had all these exterior doors that you had to replace, right? No, this oh. this project was pulled out because okay. it was approved prior to the capital maintenance and improvement plan coming to the board, so I pulled it out because we already have funding to do. Yeah. Okay, that's part of the safety grant, correct, Stephen? Yes, round two. Right, which uh, would not be part of the capital improvement in, in that budget okay. piece. Uh, that's all I have, I just wanted to clarify. 
Okay. Everybody else okay? We have a motion on the floor to approve the vouchers as described. No further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Bear with me here. <coughs> Uh, brings us to public participation and the list was just forwarded to me. We have three folks that would like to address the board tonight and in order of sign up, uh, we'll let Mr. Al Rail go first. I'll keep it short, um, personal, short means. Uh, I read an article in the paper the other day, plus I see it's on the agenda tonight, bus apps. Would somebody please explain to me why we have to spend $36,000 to put apps on our buses so we know when our buses are going to get to these kids? How many years have we picked these kids up at different stops and we've never had anything close to being an app? When I was on the board, we put cameras on some of the buses, but this is getting a little far stretched to put $36,000 in apps when we can pick our kids up and it's, they're probably within five minutes of time before they get picked up and, and we have to have this app. This is a waste of taxpayer money, period. Thank you. Okay, and next addressing us will be Rick Ale. Good evening, my name is Rick Ale and I'm a resident of 727 St. John's Avenue here in Milton. I'm here to address the board in hopes that you will all listen and keep an open mind and truly process what I have to say with my concerns. I am very concerned that the lack of honesty and ownership for most of you sitting at this board um, in front of me today. Mr. Scheiger, at the last board meeting you stated that the end of the year party for teachers cost 5,000 for the magician and the awards that were going to be used were left over from the last year to find out that this was not the case and that we actually spent 4,700 on awards and 5,000 on a magician, not a, not a speaker to make us better people, not someone that can teach us how to teach other people, a magician, tricks. We spent almost double what you said it would cost and I'm not sure if you were confused or was it just easier to get this party to pass with half the truth. When my wife and I met, met and a few of others met with you and Jerry at the administration office. They had a great conversation in which we told you that if you're going to fix this district, it needs to start from the top. Honesty, transparency, and trust. You both told us that you would completely agree, and in the same meeting you told us that before any drawings for the schools were be to release, you would meet with us and, and others in the community to get the ideas to help shape the way these buildings were going to look and how they were to function. I met with you in May after a school board meeting and you informed me that communication and talks with both us and the community members was still going to ha be happen before the drawings were released. Not only did, did not any of these communications happen, but the preliminary drawings had now been completed. We were told in the past that we had to buy a Hawk Zone because if we didn't, we were going to lose it because there was a person interested in buying it and the offer would knock us out of the running and we would lose this building forever. The community took a vote and it did not pass and as we know today, this building is still for sale. Jerry brought a solution to the school board of $35,000 to track our children at the buses as long as it stayed within an area around Milton and this was a good idea, even though we could not track our stu students or our children outside of that area. It was approved right after that, seven to zero. And after the meeting, I was approached by three members stating that they had apps on their phones to track their own children already. This brings me to my next point. I feel that since your career has almost come to an end here in Milton, I feel now is not the appropriate time to pass any type of spending agreements, contracts, and most importantly, any pay matrix for administrative assistance. Out of the respect of the person who will take over this role and they should have the final say in what happens with any income structures to the assistance that works under them. Jerry and your final day should be cleaning up, Jerry and, and Tim, your final day should be cleaning up any loose ends and your final days here should be a very clean breakup with the old saying of this breakup saying, it's not you, it's me. I will end this speech with this. I found an interesting post on Indeed where people asked if you could give four words to live by as advice to anyone coming up in a business, what would those words be? 
my very good friend said truth, honesty, integrity, and transparency. It's great words to live by. My four words were never, never, never lie. I would be very curious on what four words each of you pick. Thank you. Okay, and our third speaker to address us is Chuck Jackson. Hello. Uh, on 6-4, I sent a request to have the policy um, option be talked about. Um, I got an opinion mail uh, email from Mr. Westrick. He said that that was not an official email, it was just an opinion. Uh, I still have no response from the administration or board president. Um, I'm just asking the board, uh, is this who you are? when someone follows policy, requests something, and there's total silence from the administration, total silence from the board. I have a laundry list, so I have to go quick because I only have three minutes. New business, discussion on possible action on administrative system compensation model. Um, I assume you've crossed this out. You have not put this into the um, documentation that's available on the website. Um, I would like to see what this is going to cost before you approve it. I would certainly hope that the board would want to see the logic of the numbers, um, have an accounting and an understanding of it. Um, how can you approve this without cost knowledge? And, and why wouldn't this be presented before the board meeting so that people have an understanding and maybe there's someone who wants to talk after me because of the costing and it's not present? Um, Discussion and possible action on the Baker's utility, Baker Tilly, um, it's the same thing. There's a nice report that's in the board agenda online. It's just a spreadsheet with a bunch of numbers. Um, I hope that you're going to give the underlying logic, uh, the accounting and understanding of all these numbers. Uh, right now, it's just kind of a hodgepodge of numbers and unless you're an accountant, you can't understand it. Which brings me to the last point, which is 6D, discussion of open records request. Um, it appears, because there's highlights on there, that you are considering charging people for requesting open records. Um, the current situation of the community and press asking for records is a direct reflection of the actions of the Milton School District. This is a problem of your own doing. I respectfully request that you review this policy in eight months after the current concerns of the public and the media have been hopefully been fully answered. At that time, an assessment could be made as to the need for the fee charges. I think that it's ironic that we have the current situation in the school district. We have people asking for information. We have individuals, we have augmentation, we have the media saying that you're not providing the information that we're asking for. And I'm making a little bit of a leap here, but since the highlights are talking about the fees, I think it's ironic that you would say that we're now going to charge people to get this information. It may be something that you want to look at, but I think it should be something you look at in the future, not something that you look at today. Because everyone's asking questions because we don't know what the hell's going on. <coughs> Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. That will move us along to our legislative update. And I believe Karen's going to do that. Yes. Thank you. I will spare you the 44 pages of the cliff note version of the budget um, and just run through um, a couple of them that will touch us, hopefully. Um, uh, let's see, there is, um, they're looking at an increase of 83.2 million the first year. So this is the 2019-2021 state budget. So for the first year, there's a request for an 83.2 million dollar increase and an additional 20. 246.7 million the second year in the general school aid. They're looking at increasing the revenue limits by $175 per pupil the first year and an additional 179 by the second year. 
increasing the categorical aid by $25 the first year, which would raise it to $679 per pupil, and an additional $25 the second year, which would raise it to $704. They're looking at lowering uh, the low revenue ceiling. They're looking at increasing that to $9,700 per pupil the first year, $10,000 the second year. Looking at increasing special education aid to $15.5 million the first year, $81.3 million the second year. Um, categorical aid for mental health services increased by $3 million each year. The milk program, they're going to increase 383000 each year. Uh, and school-based mental health services collaboration grant increased that to $3.25 million each year. Um, however, keep in mind that the assembly votes on this tomorrow, and then it goes to the Senate on Wednesday, so we will know more after next or after by hopefully by the end of this week on what's actually going to pass and what we'll have to deal with for next for next budget very good <clears throat> without any questions further than that we will roll on to referendum updates and i would invite mr hoffman to the podium and share with us where we're at hello I've got just a short project administration update for you. Uh, since uh, we met just two weeks ago, uh, we've had the opportunity to have a, a couple more design uh, sessions. Uh, we're going to have uh, the majority of the time tonight uh, with the PRA uh, talking to you about uh, where the designs have advanced for the elementary schools. Uh, but in the last two weeks, as I said, there have been some design sessions uh, there with uh, the principals of each of the schools. Uh, we also went on a full day tour of some uh, swimming pools in the state. We went out to uh, St. Augustine Prep, uh, south of Milwaukee. We went to uh, Waukesha South, and we also went to Beloit Memorial and toured their pools. Some different concepts at, at each one of those facilities. Uh, the I'm going to perhaps not get the name right, but I think it's the Milton Pool Foundation. Sound right? Friends of Milton Pool, sorry about that. Um, they were along to look at uh, some of the concepts that, uh, that they had and wanted to uh, uh, see some examples of. And uh, it was a very good day. Uh, talked a lot about uh, the technical aspects of the pool, but also competition features, uh, and uh, uh, swim lesson features. So uh, I'm sure you'll hear more about that in the future. Um, we'll have a full report uh, in your board packet for the July meeting and a little bit more on the budget and the administration. But as I said, uh, tonight's focus is, is on the architecture. So unless you have any questions, um, Scott Kramer will come up and talk about the elementary school. While he while the technology is getting up and running, um, you have the schematic design packet, what we call it, uh, for the past couple of weeks to review. So hopefully you've reviewed that packet, looked at the uh, the drawings that are there, and maybe have some questions for us this evening. But we have spent quite a bit of time with the administration and the principals trying to understand the first, the programmatic needs and making sure we hit all of the programmatic needs and we have all of those spaces accounted for, not just for the new additions, but making sure the entire buildings program works for now and into the future. So that was the first step as we sat down with the principals to identify every room in each of the elementary schools, understand what those rooms are used for, and then what do we need to house in the additions. So that was the first meeting, meeting and a half that we had. And then we had a numerous, I think we had three, maybe four more additional meetings with, uh, with principals and administration, um, our construction manager, J.P. Cullen, Mike Huffman and his uh, partner, Steve. And we went through the, the planning process, working with each of the individual principals to make sure, number one, the additions were in the right location. And as you probably noticed, some of the additions actually moved from where we had them pre-referendum. 
And again, this was part of our discovery process to understand is that the right location now that we have more information, now that we have surveys of the buildings, we understand where utilities are coming in, trying to avoid that to save costs for the district. Uh, and also looking at the boundaries of the sites now that we have those boundaries, understanding where those boundaries are and how we can maximize each of the building sites for the best use of uh, those uh, principals and the students and staff. So now that we have technology up and running, we'll start with East Elementary School. Um, programmatically, it's very, very similar to what we had initially as part of the uh, pre-referendum work um, for this building. And as you can, but the one thing we did here was we worked with the staff um, and with Jen Kramer to understand how they were going to use this building, how um, it, the, the flow would take place. We never had an interior courtyard like we're showing today where we're actually surrounding an exterior space with building. But through our discovery process, having a very long corridor that just kind of dead-ended would have been problematic for the school. It would have been made for a long travel time back and forth. So by creating this courtyard, we actually created a loop around the building to make it more efficient for students and staff. It also gives a lot of natural daylight to other areas of the building that might have been be become interior um, rooms. So it really maximized uh, a lot of different functions uh, within this, this building. So does anybody have any questions on what we did here, why we did it at East? We are still working with the city of Milton to understand how this building sits on the site. It's, if you remember, this building actually sits over the property line. Right now, this building is 50 or 60 feet over the property line into the city's property. We had a meeting with the city last Thursday to understand the process that we'll need to go to to transfer that land to the school district, and that is in process right now. They don't have any problem with it, at least according to uh, who we met with at the village or at the city. So that is all uh, in process right now, and hopefully will be wrapped up in the next month or so. So we're proceeding forward, assuming that that um, process is going to take place and the land will become uh, school district property in the future. Any questions? Yes, Brian. I always have questions, right? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Um, so when I was looking at this, uh, the two questions kind of popped in my head. Mm -hmm. um, one is um, when I look at this and I compare um, compared to the pre-referendum uh, schematic or drawings. Yes. Um, the concept drawings. Mm -hmm. it, it does look like we may have a little bit more square footage. We do. Okay. There, 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 there was some thought process put behind that. Um, when we were in the process of that discovery process to understand do we have the right program here, working with, uh, with Mrs. Kramer, we, we understood that um, we were probably short a couple of classrooms here at East uh, that we were either missed or misaccounted for, however you want to put it, but pre-referendum, we were short. So in the review of all of the projects, we actually pulled a little bit of space out of the West program okay. and moved it over to East so we could balance the budgets. As we said, these budgets are going to push and pull between projects, but we know we have 59.9 and that's it. We can't go any higher than that. Yeah, that was going to be my main question is with the new extra square footage, are we still going to be within our budget? Yes, yes. So that's yes. Great. the answer is right. And then the other question is my, the old question I had back in November is, have we decided on what, and, and this probably isn't a question for you because you probably don't know, um, but have we decided on what, what we're going to store in the basement because we're like increasing it from like about up to like 4,000 square feet of storage? That's probably a question for... That's, that's definitely probably not a question for you, I'm sure. I don't really have a definite answer for that right now because having everything in the basement is such a challenge because you have to lug everything up and down stairs. So for example, the stuff that we store in the basement right now is all of the paper products. That'll all move upstairs. The, the idea of what we're gonna store down in the basement is kinda up in the air right now, but mm -hmm. uh, the goal is to keep everything on the first floor as much as we can. And, and just to, I think I probably know the answer this, but I just wanna verify, uh, we're not, um, we're not uh, digging or building a, an additional basement area underneath yeah. the new 
No, I can't. Just, I, I thought that was the answer. I just wanted to confirm. Thanks. Yeah, confirm. And just so we're all aware, we have gone through our first budget exercise with the construction manager, and right now all the, the, the four elementary schools are on budget with what we had pre-referendum. So we're, we're doing well. Yes. I have one question. It looks like we're losing a lot of playground space. We are. I think if you can go to the site plan, Stephen, if you can. We are losing playground space underneath where the new addition is going to go, but we are going to recreate that playground space to the south. So whatever they're losing, they're going to gain that back to the south. Right there. So you're right, it goes right across where it is now. So the plan is to move it out this way. We still have our playground space all in this area. So mm -hmm. black top is what we're losing. That's also part of the conversation with the city is not only accommodating a property line that fits the building onto our property, but also additional hard surface <laughs> playground and also uh, moving the pieces of equipment that would get in the way of this as well. Other questions on East? All right, we'll move on to West. West was a fairly large change to the project. We actually relocated the addition totally. Um, initially, the addition was uh, heading off of the other side of the building, off of the, uh, the current uh, cafeteria gymnasium area. But as we started understanding the site more, understanding where utilities came into the building, we felt that boy, that might not be the right place for that addition. And as we uh, worked with the principal out there, we, uh, it, it became very clear that the better location, the less expensive location to build would be building off of the south side of the building, extending that corridor down to the south, and then again, on the side, recreating some of that playground area that we are losing uh, underneath that addition. Programmatically, pretty much the same elements that are um, being included that we had pre-referendum, um, with the exception of the, uh, we had in the pre-referendum, we had some additional square footage being added to the cafeteria to increase the size of the seating area of the cafeteria. But in discussions, we determined that if we can combine and use the cafeteria and the gymnasium by opening those two up a little bit further, it would allow us to have lunch periods that spread between those two rooms so we didn't have to add additional square footage to allow that additional seating capacity to happen. And that's where we got the additional money and square footage to shift over to east to allow that building's program to expand. <coughs> So otherwise, we went through the same process in terms of verifying the programmatic areas, understanding what every room in the building was going to be used for, making sure we had enough sections of each uh, grade level available to them, uh, and then putting that in place uh, on the plan. Any questions on West? probably the two that are the closest to what we had pre-referendum. These plans have not changed uh, you know, dramatically from where we were. Probably the biggest change uh, at Harmony was one of the classrooms that we had just called a general classroom is actually going to be a kindergarten classroom and we are equipping it as a kindergarten classroom with its own toilet and storage room. So that was a small change to the project, but it worked for their programmatic needs uh, to make sure they are covered in terms of uh, their needs at each grade level. But otherwise, the plan itself has not changed really from the uh, the referendum. The, uh, the site plan is uh, pretty much identical. The driveway will be extended all the way around that building to make that loop. Uh, it's just not shown on these drawings that we didn't have the information from the surveyor slash civil engineer um, that we have today. So. When we update you again uh, in a month or so on the projects, you will see the civil uh, engineering plans that will show all those play areas and hard surface areas around each of the buildings. One thing to note real quick too is that Scott and his team took the time to 
it's kind of hard to see on this, but uh, <coughs> the area of where a future edition could be. Right, right. You know, one of the things that we were thinking about and discussing with uh, with the principals, principals was which of the schools is probably going to experience the highest growth, and which of the schools has capacity or room to physically expand on site. And really, uh, Harmony was the one school that seemed to have the ability to expand on site. This edition that we're putting on here now was a planned edition. Back in 2004, when we did the expansion here, we planned to have this edition on. We knew this was a growing area, so we planned for this future expansion. But we're also thinking that, boy, if this continues to grow, what happens? Do we have to build a new school? Or does this school still have a little bit of growth capacity left in it? And the answer is yes. We think we could add another four classrooms here and not really have to do much other than a similar addition to what we have shown currently. So there is a way to expand this building in place without adding another whole school to the district. sequence for security purposes. We've got an office in there, a um, small conference room, a health room, toilets, and then a, a handicap lift to get you down to the gymnasium cafeteria level, which doesn't exist today. We're then also renovating um, the two main toilet facilities there, bringing those up to ADA standards, and then renovating the current office space into some flexible areas for, uh, for learning and teaching. Very, very similar to what we had pre referendum. I think the square footages are pretty much right out. Questions? Well, we will be going through this same exercise in uh, several weeks for the middle school first, uh, doing the same thing, presenting where we're at with that middle school design. And then a month after that, same thing with the high school at the schematic design level. And as we discussed uh, at our last meeting two weeks ago, this is a time for the board to review, understand what we're doing, and then really say, yes, this is direction as a board, as a school district, that we want to go with these four projects. And we're at a point now where we like the plan, we believe we're on budget with the current estimates, and we're ready to move into the next phase of work, which is the design development phase, where we start developing all the interiors, what does it look like on the outside, um, and start looking at all of the mechanical systems and how are those systems gonna integrate throughout the building. Okay, <coughs> questions from anyone? Hearing none, I would uh, recommend the motion that we approve the schematic design for Milton East, West, consolidated in harmony as presented and to authorize PRA to begin design and development phase of these elementary schools. I'll second. Before we vote, I, I, sorry, I apologize. I do have one other question, and I'm not sure who this would be directed to, but uh, kind of, uh, um, I guess, piggybacking off of uh, what one of the uh, participants, the, uh, public participation participants had said, is there going to be an opportunity to, um, I guess, get, have like a, a community um, session, if you will, information session, so they can kind of review this, or, you know, possibly offer suggestions if they have any? I guess I don't know. Well, with the board being in charge of the process, we've, we've gone, we take the direction of the board to, to move forward in the space. Obviously, there's, you know, the, the approval of this gets us the design development part. Um, if there's a desire for the board to continue to get input, 
then the board needs to give administration direction for that. We've been, we've had board members at meetings um, throughout this process and that's not come up as far as, we, we've brought it up, but it's not been a, a topic that the members of the board have wished to pursue. And so if there's continued input that the board wishes to have from the community, then I think that the board needs to uh, have a conversation and make some decisions as to whether or not it wants to continue down this path or to continue to have public meetings to give input. That's not the board though to give us direction as administration as to how you want to proceed. I guess I'm just, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, address the concern, um, that we, I think it would be, I think the community would be appreciative if at the very least, you know, before we get to the point where we go, that we are able to present it to them in a, in a more formalized uh, manner. Um, but that's, that's my opinion. Uh, communication is always good, you know, that's, and whatnot, so. Well, and I happen to agree with Brian. I think if it's something that we've expressed to the community that we would be doing, um, then I think we need to follow through with that as a board. Um, even if it's simply presenting these drawings to them and saying, you know, this is what we're looking at, this is what we plan on presenting to the board, do you have any questions, any concerns, any ideas? I don't think it's a case where we're gonna get 500 people saying, well, no, move this here, move that there. These obviously have not changed much from what was presented. I don't know what's gonna happen with the middle school or the high school, um, but I do think the community does deserve that respect and have that input. We're happy to do whatever the board directs. So if you'd like us to come and present this to the public, we're, we're happy to do that. Anybody else? Caveat is the fact that we are on a very, very tight schedule, so it has to be done in a very timely fashion. Otherwise, we're gonna miss our steps and we're not gonna be in the ground in October and we're not gonna be occupied a year from this August. So we're, we're happy to come whenever you're ready for us. Okay. Uh, so I guess the next steps is, um, we, if we probably wanna talk about this as a board. Um, I don't know if now is the proper time to do it and we put an amendment on the, on the motion or um, is this something, I mean, you know, we're, we're pretty much done with the, I guess, the schematic design portion because we're voting on it, but I mean, um, we have time to discuss and possibly come up with a decision on the next step, which is the, I had it in Design mind. development. Thank you, design development, uh, which is, I had that in there too, it's like in, I don't know, like July, right? It's coming up quick, yeah. It is July, at the end of July, if I remember correctly. Bill, can I have permission just to ask a couple of clarifying questions? Yes. In to the request for uh, public yep. input. Um, and you know what, you might be able to help me a little bit more, but at this point in the game, not in the game, but through this process, um, like what I'm wondering what you're looking for, I understand the input piece, right? But if you're looking for understanding why things are put places, mm -hmm. you know that is gonna be more of a, like a discussion. So for example, like in the west drawing, Stephen, that you had had up. The original plan, we had talked about adding um, four classrooms, one for each grade level, like that would be an example, right? But when you look at this drawing, you're gonna see in the one with the color, Stephen, yep, that one right there. When you zoom in, you're gonna see that some of those green boxes are maybe labeled something different, like art and music, right? Yep. So they're displacing the current art and music rooms because they're not at uh, size that we would like, putting them in the addition, and then in turn, turning those classrooms into regular grade level classrooms. Like that's an example. But public input in something like that, you know, the administration or principals or staff are gonna have a better understanding, not that you right. don't, but in the day to day, living down in those trenches, right, on what makes sense. So I'm not quite sure, my question would be, but remember, you guys know more than I do, but what uh, would public input at this point in that phase, how would that be productive? Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying I'm not mm -hmm. for it, I just don't understand what that would look like. Yeah. And maybe these well, guys know. And I, I think I might have misspoke. I, I, maybe a better term would just be, you know, just communicate what it is instead of having it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, kind of present it a little bit more formally to the, to the public. and. You know, if somebody has a great idea. I mean, I mean, 
it's great, you could use it, but you know, sometimes you can't use everybody's idea. But uh, um, but at least you know, at, to me, the communication piece is a big piece for me. So however you'd like us to communicate, and it's it's not atypical to communicate, um, whether it's boards up in the school showing where you're at progress wise, or whether it's emails, emailers. Uh, you know, on the website, however you want to handle that. Jen and I am not suggesting that um, mm -hmm. that the board or the community would know better on where to put the classrooms. I think, again, along Brian's lines, just that communication so they know where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, you know, suddenly the pool's in the front of the, just for the high school, the sure. pool's in the front of the building and now all of a sudden it's in the back of the building. Mm -hmm. But maybe it really truly does work better if it's on the west end of the building. And sure. and, and not to say that you know these folks are not going to look at that, um, but there somebody may go, well, wait a minute, and something that we haven't looked at. Cause, you know, it's kind of like proofreading your own paper. You miss all the mistakes that you've made because you just put them in there. Mm -hmm. So I've learned to admit yep. this process so far, things that I think about that they did or vice versa, not just me, but Sarah Marsha. Right. Yep. And, 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 and really, Mike, Mike has been challenging us on our design for the high school. You know, in terms of where does the pool go? Does it fit better on the back side of the high school, the front side of the high school, to design a facility? And we're working through those now. And I think just keeping the public informed of that maybe is where we need to go, rather than suddenly, hey, we passed the referendum and now here, here, here's the schematics for four elementary schools. Wasn't the schematics part of our last board packet? Yes, two yeah, weeks ago. Was and they've been out there for the public to look at for a couple weeks. So it wasn't that it was just put in front of us today. I'm just saying a little bit more formally. I mean, some people can't always get to the website, but even though it's your regular. Chuck, do you have a question? Yeah, I was going to say I've been there, done that. I totally agree with everything that Jan said, that the community is well-meaning but they don't have the inside knowledge that Jan has, that the architect has. So they are not going to design the building for you. So I totally agree with what Jan said. The reason I initially put my hand up is just to request that you create a tab on the district website and put all these schematics on it so that people have the opportunity to see it. And maybe that's how we solve our communication issue then, yeah. is that it's out there. I might also add- Thank you, Joe. Uh, and just one comment that uh, I think you can look at this project, uh, how how you will involve the community and how you will roll out uh, the current design. I think you can look at it differently in different pieces. Uh, so Scott mentioned that uh, you're kind of under the schedule uh, pressures, certainly for the elementary school. J.P. Cullen has a, a plan to get out and break ground yet this fall. I think that presents itself very differently than the, the time frame on the high school. I think you might want to uh, think about where the community will interface with your facilities the most uh, and, and maybe do a, a more extensive rollout uh, you know, with, with the pool, uh, how it impacts the PAC and, and things like that. I think when you look at the elementary school, elementary schools, um, they've really followed us specific set of program criteria and and have just massaged the configuration of delivering that program and uh, I, I'm, I'm just guessing that uh, uh, you might get a lot more valuable input when we look at those spaces that the community will come to in, in mass. Right, and maybe it is the middle school and high school or particularly the high school where we do seek a little bit more of that community input. Because um, I think for the most part, the community did not have much disagreement over the fact that the elementary needed space, and I don't think they really much cared where it went, um, just as long as we got what, what the kids needed. Yeah. I, I think it's probably a great idea to have your architectural team you know, stand up and present to the community some aspects of it. You know, maybe you roll up all all the schematic design together when it's when it's all complete and, and present that. You could build up a, a lot of excitement for the coming construction phase. The construction phase will have some pain for everybody, and I think you want to sort of goose up the excitement factor before all the pain sets in uh, of uh, the construction process. Not that it isn't fun. <laughs> I've lived through the construction and not the 
and jackhammers over Heather. <laughs> Okay, I have a motion and second on the floor, um, which I would repeat for your clarity, is to approve the schematic designs for East-West Consolidated in Harmony as presented, and to authorize PRA to begin the design and development phase for these elementaries. Any other discussion on that motion? I would certainly do so. Uh, we will roll call vote it, and as is my habit, I will start on my left, which makes Ms. Diamond first. Yes. Rick? Yes. Tom? Yes. Joe is yes. Karen? Yes. Mike? Yes. Brian? Yes. That is a 7-0 vote. That motion passes. Thank you for that. But I would say in conjunction with that, it wasn't an either or. I think we will increase our communication and uh, dissemination of information and designs and so forth via the website or any other manner, manner that we think we can um, get it out in front of folks. So and we can do both. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that brings us up to the other unsexy piece of our referendum update is our ref uh, bond sale. And I am certainly no expert on the bond sale, but I uh, had kind of an exciting day last Thursday when they called to tell me that they sold it. And uh, I know enough to know that that was a pretty big deal. And uh, we do not have the luxury of uh, having uh, Diane Pertzborn here tonight, who is our Barrett representative nor Lisa Boyson from Baird that could probably glamorize that a little bit more for you. But what I can tell you is that the net interest rate they communicated to me is 2.8%. Um, we went to referendum forecasting four or four and a quarter on $59.9 million. The difference is approaching $15 million in what I'll say are savings for the district, but that isn't necessarily savings we can spend. That's $15 million less the community has to pay for this referendum over the life of the bonds. It is a big, big deal. So, thank you for everyone that had, had some play in, in our bond rating and uh, getting that work done. That was a that was a huge, huge day for us. So I can't give you a lot of the uh, details on the, the dollars and how they move around, but uh, it was a great day. I would just like to echo too the, to the thanks to the business office and getting yes. all the information um, with, with the Monday and the, and the group getting all the information uh, so they could take that information and get a very good interest rate on the box. So thank you to the business office. I will read with you to you one thing that, that uh, amazed me a little bit. Uh, Lisa sent me an email that day. It says, just to give you an idea on how well the bonds were sold, one of the debt issues that we used for a comparable sold in the market today for a Wisconsin district rated AA1, which is two notches better than Milton, and they ended up with a higher interest rate by five hundredths of a percent. So the uh, AA1 would be the, the lower rating. So we have a higher rating than that, and it shows Oh, Lisa's, Lisa's email says two notches better than Milton's. So, depending on how you interpret it. But the, the gist of it was, Lisa was like a kid in a candy store. She was just euphoric over getting these bonds sold. And there was incredible interest. And uh, an initial email said that they had oversold them. There was more people wanting to buy them than we had money to, to, to put out in bonds. So everything went just wonderful for that. So that's enough for that of that for now. Uh, moving on to number three on the agenda is updates, and that would be Karen giving us an update on the Transportation Committee. Um, <clears throat> after the meeting two weeks ago, um, I had several people approach me um, and call me regarding the, the bus app and exactly what it was all about. Um, so I had asked Joe to put me on tonight's agenda just to kind of give you an update. Um, I've done a little more research. I've talked to Rightway um, a little bit more about this. Um, the name of the app is actually Here Comes the Bus. Um, it is currently um, has over 1 million users and it is nationwide, or excuse me, worldwide. Um, it stretches right now into Canada. Their little blip on their um, website is from Canada to California. Um, so it is a, a worldwide um, app that is used. Um, it is used quite heavily in the East Coast. I noticed that. Um, 
it basically it's you know provides safety for your kids. We don't they don't have to wait in the blistering heat. They don't have to wait in the, the polar vortex. Um, they have some idea of when the bus is coming. It is an app that can be it's a free app that we can get either on Google Play or from the App Store. Um, you can download it on um, any sort of smart device, and if you don't have a smart device, it can be used on tablets and computers. Um, it basically already uses um, the GPS systems that are standard on most of our school buses now already, so it's um, not two additional stuff that has to go on to the buses. Um, this app has won an innovation award from IHS Merikit, which um, at the national, excuse me, at the annual Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. Um, it's the industry leading app in all of this information. Um, there are currently four districts in the state of Wisconsin that currently use it, so lucky for us, we are not necessarily the guinea pigs. Um, when I had talked to um, an individual from Rightway, she had said that we've had some of our Rightway bus drivers um, able to drive in the districts that have had um, or that currently use the Here Comes My Bus app um, and absolutely love it. They rave about it, um, said, when, when can we get it? Um, the four districts are Rightway districts. Um, and when I talked to Ashley, she said, there, not one person, not a driver or a parent, has come to them and said, this is not what we expected. They all are very happy with it. Um, we're very excited that they have it. Um, there, are, there are three different options with this program, and unfortunately, I do not know which one Rightway is looking at. But there is simply the Here Comes the Bus, which basically is a GPS map that will tell you, oh, the bus is at this intersection, and you can watch the bus go down the road. Um, and you can do that as a standalone. You can also do the student ridership or student tracking only. And basically what that does is it, um, it gives you the bus number, the time and location um, of the scan when the child entered the bus, and that's pretty much all it does. Or you can get the Here Comes the Bus and the student ridership. And what that does is that lets you track the bus it lets you see when your child got on the bus at home, when they got off the bus at school. Um, it works for multiple children on multiple buses. Um, and it is um, very safe and secure. Nobody can access your child's information except that parent. There is a specific access code and some passwords that you have to enter to be able to get that information. Um, it gives you real-time information on the exact location of your child's bus. Um, you know exactly when your child has arrived at school or at home. Um, what can happen, and then, like I said, I don't know which way right way is going, but either there's a scanner on, uh, like a barcode on their student ID that they can scan when they get on the bus, um, or the driver can enter the child's name in the bus, which will give them that information. So. And the the, uh, the portion of the app that we were looking at initially was the where the bus, the the student scanner. We had not purchased that additional at this point, and that's something that we were going to see how the technology worked with the app, and then before we added it'd be additional cost for the. Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me back in the office how much of that is, but the barcode scan is would be step two okay. if we feel that the baseline with the the bus is tracking well. The parents can track the the you know, bus 121, for example. Where is it at in relationship to my house? Um, and then if the uh, if the the board and the, the staff are, are satisfied with that, then we can work the logistics of the scan. And obviously that'd be a, um, we've talked about this with some of our elementary friends, um, having the, um, how does it impact when you're scanning each kid on the bus? How does it impact the bus route? And so we want to see how this goes first and then potentially add that down the road. So. And there's also a terminal that the bus driver can ma actually manually enter that information. Right. So if they're at a stop and, for example, they see my four kids standing there and pulling up, they already know that they're there, they can start entering that information. Right. So, okay, that is all I have. Okay. Moving on, uh, Human Resources Committee, Mr. Westrick. Okay, we have the uh, Indian Interim Superintendent Applications. 
we had eight. Um, the group has decided that we will introduce three. Uh, and last Monday evening, in closed session, we uh, unanimously decided on one candidate, and that information uh, we will go over the contractual component of it in closed session. And then we'll uh, reconvene an open session and make an announcement later this week. So stay tuned. Um, <coughs> moving along, we are up to the curriculum committee report. Karen, yes. Okay, we will invite Tara Huber to the podium. Discussion and possible action on 66 point or full and full 3101 Jedi Consortium Agreement. PowerPoint presentation also to your emails, so you can follow along on your own email if you want. Um, the consortium agreement was sent in the board docs. So JEDI is um, a, a virtual school um, that we are looking to be um, a part of their consortium. So much like the MECUS consortium that we sort of own and um, run, this would be, we would be partnering with JEDI that is out of CISA 2 um, with other neighboring districts to offer virtual school experiences. So um, if you click through, um, and I have a couple of JEDI people here who are wonderful and came to um, answer any questions that you have about the consortium. Kim Anderson and Tina is their registrar. Um, so they can answer any of those like program questions or consortium questions. Um, but for years now, we have been talking and thinking about expanding our options in the um, alternative education world. So not just at risk, but also offering just more programming that would meet student needs that we're seeing grow over the years. Um, every year we lose, for the last five years that I've tracked at the high school, we, use, we lose 10 to 17 kids. Um, yearly to virtual schools that are in neighboring districts um, because we just simply don't offer a full-time version of online schooling. Um, Jedi would do that for us. If you want to click to the next. Um, so the old Jedi that we used to know, um, that you sort of logged in and you were with a group of teachers that has changed in the years and they've adapted to um, the new way of, of online schooling and this is kind of their timeline which you can read through. Um, the next slide kind of explains JEDI a little bit more, so why we would choose JEDI. So currently in the District of Milton we pay for Edmentum to be our sole vendor of online programming. Um, we are looking at spacing that out over the next year, phasing that out. We're going to reduce our contract for this next year. Um, still in discussions about that, but reducing that. Right now, we use it for summer school programming, um, for academic makeup for students. We use it kind of hit and miss for civics courses for our next step students, and just a variety of sprinkled in seventh and eighth graders for various reasons. Um, we use it kind of hit and miss, and it's um, blended with other programming which has worked well in some situations and again other situations not as well. Um, so this would be, um, that I use is, is it 17 different vendors? 17 different vendors, so like we have Edmentum as one that offers several different online programs or courses. Um, they are able to, through the consortium, we can have all of those different programs and different um, vendors at our disposal because we're buying them all together. 
And so we can have access to a lot more uh, curriculum. So all of the curriculum is vetted. There are AP courses. Again, we can, we can offer this at higher levels or we can offer it at at-risk um, academic makeup levels. It's a K-12 curriculum, which we haven't had. Um, and, and not that we're going to use that solely at our elementary schools, but it's just another option for expanding our programming. Um, it is a cooperative agreement, so that makes it cost effective for us to get this much programming. Um, and I'll go through the costs at the end. Um, NCAA accreditation, <coughs> they have their own staff that works through student services that would work with our staff. Um, if you want to click to the next slide. So again, PK-12 offerings, all of the core subjects, variety of electives, um, 30 AP tour courses. There's also dual credits with Blackhawk Tech. Anywhere else? Um, we just started a certification program. So for students who are struggling a little, a little bit more academically, we can put them in a certificate program from one of our vendors. So when they graduate, we're working with Blackhawk Tech, so they'll test on their site. And then they would graduate with a certificate in healthcare or um, I'm trying to think of one of the other big ones that I've been looking at. Um, some management, some human resources. So it gives them a little bit of an edge in terms of leaving high school and going on to the career, their career. Um, they have the world language options, which we do do with some students. Um, take world languages that we don't offer in our building. They take those online currently. Um, and then just, it's 80 pages of course options. Today I was browsing and it's, it's a lot. It's something for everybody. So, um, again, the curriculum, the pre-K-12, we haven't had that option. And Ryan Ruggles and I have been going through kind of our three-year plan with this, um, starting out pretty small this first year and trying to recoup some of those full-time students that we've lost to our neighboring districts that offer full-time online classes. Um, that would be our first goal. Also, using this in those hit and miss um, occasions when we've needed online curriculum for kids, so using this instead of our other programming um, so we can get our, our that other program phased out. Um, you want to go to the next slide? So there's, there's a one-on-one -on -one instructor, there's a learning coach, and a student services coordinator from JEDI. Here at our building, at the high school, I would be the person each each building um, will have their own go-to admin. And then um, at the high school, we'll use our alt-ed counselor, Dan Thies, who helps with all things alt-ed already. And he currently does our online programming, so he's going to help from, from our site. So we'll have kind of a team around all of the kids that, that choose to do this. Um, you know, there's pacing charts, there's four-year plans, all of that was in that course binder. And it was really, um, really weighed up, laid out well for families to, to choose what they want. Um, our responsibility, so we have to um, monitor our district report updates, so the kids and how they're doing, and, and monitor those things. Um, we approve all enrollments and course schedules. Again, we're going to start small this year um, and see how things go and what we need and adjust. Um, we own state testing with those kids, so if we bring them back to our district, they will do our state testing at the high school or ACT and ACT Aspire. Um, we also can offer full-time students to come and take electives or world language on site or whatever class they decide. I already have um, two or three families that would like to do that. One family I know that's going to do um, art because they want online curriculum, but then taking our classes um, so that if we go with this that would be what they would choose so something like that for families and students to decide we monitor their graduation requirements so they still have to have all the requirements that are in our policies and then of course we have to, to monitor and maintain their transcripts so the cost savings to each member district and there were like 12 or 13 districts <coughs> Oh, 15, okay. All of our neighbors are already in JEDI. Um, so hopefully can retain some of those students and get, get them back from the other online opportunities they're getting in other districts. 
um, capturing some of our homeschool students. That's kind of in our three-year plan. A lot of districts have used this to bridge the gap um, for some of our homeschool families and offer them some curriculum through here. Um, that would give us the ability to count those homeschooled students as our students, but then give them some of the curriculum that Jedi offers. Um, and which out there, um, if you talk to some of our homeschool um, families, it keeps that homeschool what they really want for their students, but then offers more um, selection for them. And then retain some of our students um, traveling, and, and the agreement is, is pretty cost effective. Um, we don't duplicate services, it's the efficiency and the costs. Um, right now, our Ed Mentum contract, <coughs> if we kept it the way that we have in other years, is more than Jedi would cost. <coughs> so we're phasing that out, bringing Jedi in with a lot more options and opportunities for kids. So here's the, the breakdown, the membership <coughs> fee. Um, it's, 10500 for a year to be a part of the consortium. The first year of a three-year contract, though, is 5000 So if we went with this this first year, it's $5,000 for the program. Um, right now, Edmentum costs us twelve. dollars um, after everything's said and done. Uh, a full-time student is about $5,000 a year, but that's half of our state aid. So if we get some of those online students back, three of them would make it cost neutral for this program. Um, and like I said, there's at least 20 that I can think of over the past few years that we would reach out to and, and try and offer them. A lot of them did not leave our district because of our district. They just wanted online programming when we have those conversations with parents and families. They just wanted online programming. So um, I think there are, there are several that would come back to our district. Um, course costs for singleton classes, which they offer. Um, to students and that's where we want to be um, mindful about what classes we're offering and who to and vet out some of those options but they would be 295 a class and then the credit recovery that we use now um, would be 200 a course which we would also have to change the way that we think about summer school in the next couple of years which we do pretty much every year so um, some of those advantages you can read through I think the biggest thing for us is that it offers that full-time online programming and then also the other thing that I'm really excited about is that we can offer families um, some of that choice that they've wanted in online programming that our one vendor doesn't give us right now. Any questions for Kim or I? Hey, here. Um, so with this JEDI program, um, the online uh, learning, how, who, I, do you have like a target um, group of students or can any student decide, hey, I, I think I want to do some online schooling and, and go through the application process, I'm, I'm guessing? How, how does that work? Like, how do, Is it open to any student or is it? So the first thing we're going to do is try and get back the students that we already had. Um, I have some students that have been kind of doing a blended version of online already, which is hit and miss. We're pulling from different places and it's not a good overall program. Um, it's really that between our counseling staff and their staff who kind of vets kids out also through the application process, they also do a starter course that kids have to take and pass because online learning sounds really great to a lot of teenagers. Um, however, <laughs> not it's not cut up, not everybody. Um, I don't see the floodgates opening and a lot of people wanting this as a full-time option. I mean, like I said, a lot of kids will say they do, but um, um, there, aren't, there aren't that many parents who would allow that right off the bat. So I think with their program that they make them do to begin with, that will help kind of vet out who, who's gonna make it and who isn't. Um, we also, through our discussion and decisions, decision rules, will have them be checking in with the, our Alted staff member, Jane at district office, um, and there'll be somebody here on site, so they'll have to have some contact with 
um, people of the district throughout their courses too, um, which I think there are many students who go to online schooling now and we will see return, um, usually after our count, and usually um, because there was no follow-up. Yeah. Um, it's different in every program, but some kids can successfully hide for a few weeks, but not long. <laughs> yeah. We created the online literacy course so that the district had the ability to do a yes-no, because there are parents who will come in and say, I would like my child to go to online school. And the district says no, and they say fine, and then we'll bring them rolling someplace else. And then you lose them, they're gone. This is the ability to say, okay, we're gonna try this 10-day program. And you successfully completing this class means that yes, you're ready to do it. And we put them through everything they need to do to be successful in an online venue. We talk about time management, which is the biggest issue for online students. We have them look at all of our vendors. We have them look at technical issues, problem solving, communication. And if they're not successful, that gives us the ability to have the conversation of, we gave you this chance and it didn't work so well. Maybe we need to rethink what the pattern is or where you're going because I understand you don't want to be in the building, but this isn't working either. So what's a good solution for it? And it, it's worked really well for our districts as we've implemented it so that you don't lose them until you know two weeks before the semester ends when they come back with no credits, nothing to do for the next two weeks, and you're struggling to get them to at least buy into the, <coughs> into the system. I have a question about, because he called something an on-campus course. So does that mean that, say, a, a full-time MHS student could take one or two courses? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it's the $285. That's 295 yeah, okay. for those singleton courses. And right now we have um, a handful of students who do that through other vendors, and we pay for that separately. Um, so that's not the family's cost? No. That's, okay. That's ours. Right. So we're hoping to recoup some of that also, um, if the programming's similar. And then in the future, um, we won't need to have that happen because we'll have those courses offered already. Those are lost through part-time open enrollment course mm -hmm. options, or with this course options that start college now or early college credit. So mm -hmm. this would be having this option, when I bring those reports to you twice a year, we would be able to recoup some of those students. If this um, passes tonight, can kids enroll in this in the upcoming fall yes. semester? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Again, starting small. <laughs> I don't want to get too ahead of sure. of what we have because it's adding on to our programming. But um, yeah, our three-year plan is to to start small this <coughs> year, see how it goes, expand for the next year, and, and see where the budget falls to and how much we take in versus how much we spend. And, we want to be thoughtful about it, but I think I've always believed in Milton that we needed more options for the district, for the size of our district, and we've kind of, we've added those here and there. Um, we've blended a lot of things, and now this kind of brings it all full circle um, so that we don't have to be picking and choosing from different places. So. For a cost-saving reference, I don't have my books in front of me, but I know you mentioned at community level, we have our foreign language we paid quite a bit of money for someone to take a foreign language class but if we have this program it's significantly cheaper do you know that yeah so a couple of those do the part-time open enrollment to other districts that have virtual programs um, that are better than our Edmentum offerings um, so some of those students would be able to still take those classes through us and then do it for the 295 versus what we pay for part-time open enrollment is significant Karen, correct me if I'm wrong, I think one of the things we talked about at committee level too is that this would give a student another option should they be facing, well, facing but should they be expelled? Yes, good point. Um, some of those discussions that we have about expulsions and what happens to those students and what can we offer them, we've offered them hit and miss Edmentum online classes, but this we could offer to expelled students as a full-time option, which would be great. Mr. President, I make a motion to approve the 66-0301 Jedi Consortium Agreement as presented. I'll second it. Okay, uh, motion from Karen, seconded by Tom to approve the motion that Karen outlined for you there. Is there any further discussion? Or any other questions? 
Hearing none, all in favor of the aforementioned motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion clearly passes. Thank you. And I presume Mr. Billhorn will be joining us next for a discussion. Yeah. Um, yep. I'm going to talk about that. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. No, Mr. Billhorn's up there to ask any questions. Um, just real briefly, um, during the committee meeting, we talked about um, the high school's pending move to the trimester schedule starting in the 2021 school year. Um, this is something that the high school has been looking at for a couple of years now and is for one year, for the past year, um, and is kind of now making that move. So their plan is to take this next school year um, and kind of work out all the kinks and make sure they've got a schedule that's going to fit everybody's needs, specifically student needs and teacher needs um, here at the high school. And then the plan is to roll that out in the fall of 2020. That is correct. Oh, and I did forget to mention that in September or October of this year, Mr. Billhorn will actually give us a full live presentation of the trimester schedule and what that's going to look like for us here. I shared with you the presentation that we had at the curriculum committee, so we went into more detail on some of the reasons why. Uh, we, the communication timeline with families will be uh, at the start of this next school year, just into September, so there's not confusion about what's going to be happening this fall. Uh, but we will have a full presentation about the, how it's going to work. Uh, but just some of the main questions people get is that it's still up. It's still, it's just reorganizing our school year. When some people hear trimester, they think that we're going to go into the summer. That's not the case. Uh, but it's just how we're going to reorganize the school year and how we work, reorganize the day and how we use the, the time we have. Okay, any questions for Mr. Billhorn? Uh, I have a few. Of course, great. Uh, uh, so I was looking at the presentation, and uh, uh, again, like that on the fourth side, slide, it says that uh, um, that the committee visited neighboring schools. With, we did. Uh, try, um, which, which schools were those? We, uh, for the trimester, there's four districts we've been working with. We did a, a visit, on-site visit with Elkhorn and with Watertown. And we've been working quite a bit with Sauk uh, Prairie School District. Uh, and Monroe as well. So those are two schools within the conference who I've had a lot of communication with them in their process and what they, uh, how they've gone through that. Some of the, the, the reasons they look for that. Um, I meet every single month with the high school principals and Badger Conference, so that's 16 schools. One of our topics we talk about the most is how do we use the time that we have and make the most efficient use of it. And as there are school, and most schools that have uh, have either moved from a straight eight or straight seven day and they're moving to one of two or three different options or they've either done, either done it or they're in the process of looking to do it yeah. uh, and so that's that's a topic we talk about an awful lot so the most common ones that go to the trimester or to a modified block or a rotating schedule i'll spare the details but uh, the ones that have gone to the tri and conference are monroe sock and watertown uh, we've also been i've also talked quite a bit with Elkhorn. Uh, for a variety of things with the project leading the way and their added program as well, but we talk, uh, we talk with the principal there about uh, the trimester as well. So, um, with, the, um, with the school districts that you talked with, did they, uh, um, I imagine when you discuss it, you, there's pros and cons yes. and, and stuff like that. Um, did they mention any specific challenges that we have to be on the lookout for? You, you know, the biggest challenge that was universal across was just the, your, we, and I'll be sharing this more in, in the fall, but the biggest challenge uh, is that we're going to be moving from teaching eight 43 or 45 minute class periods to now teaching in a 67 or 70 minute uh, block or period. And so you're, you're teaching for a longer period of time and you're covering content over two thirds of the year instead of a, a full school year. So you have to, how you teach is going to change and how you teach and that's something that uh, we've talked quite a bit with the staff and the staff committee that worked on this um, have identified. That's why this next year is a planning year. A lot of our professional development is going to be around teaching. It's uh, it, it offers a lot more opportunities, especially for your lab-based classes, uh, and uh, and how we approach instruction will will change. Yeah, and actually, that was another question I had because you know, as a former math teacher, it just it was just really convenient that everything I was teaching 
but at each section fell perfectly in a 50 minute block. Yeah. And there are some that are really going to like that. And, and, and that's one of the part of this process is actually we'll be talking with staff and those schools we've already arranged for our professional development day. I'll be taking staff to each of those four high schools shadowing people and how they've done it. That's part of the project. Yeah, because sure. I imagine there are lots of times you're going to have to change. Absolutely. You know, that's, now you're trying to get that's why this is a planning year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, the other um, question I had is um, there are these other types that you looked at these other solutions and maybe maybe this is probably better uh, for another time, but I'm just kind of wondering um, uh, what the pros and cons of each one were and why trimesters was selected over the other ones, um, but maybe that's something we can discuss. I think I'll probably go into that later in the year and I can certainly uh, take a look, but uh, in short, it's great. We, we, we looked at what our biggest needs were, our biggest concerns with the current eight period day, uh, and we laid, we kept going back to those, what those concerns were. Trimester meant every single item that we were looking for. We also had to, uh, one of the parameters was I need to make sure that uh, we can staff it as well too, so it's a staffing neutral. So there was one other option we liked a lot better, but I would need about 15 more teachers, and I didn't think that was going to work. Yeah, <laughs> why not? Um, and then um, I'm sure you guys considered this, but um, I know just based on experience in teaching, you know, it's like having students, especially the last hour of the day, having and being able to get them to focus just 50 minutes a day is can be tough. But now we're asking them to. to you know, be in class and focus for six to seven minutes a day. Is that something you know, no, that the teachers are going to be looking at to mitigate? Uh, yeah, and that's things? part of what the training is going to be this year. But I would also argue, yes, I asked that question uh, both uh, 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 Jack Harnish at Sauk Ferry and Bill Loss at Watertown. And they uh, both said that's offset too by the fact, and this is what I'll be sharing, is that in the, the trimester, you have a lot less transitions. Uh, and so you're, it, it's, there's a lot less transitioning, and you're, it's actually able to focus a lot more too in those longer class periods because you are. That's it's less teachers you're having to um, understand what all the procedures are, and it's it's, uh, uh, it's it's the the slower pace of the day is what every at every school that I've talked to they talk about it just the day seems slower mm -hmm. uh, in a good way. And it's not that uh, fast paced transition from class to class to class. Um, last question. Um, I know you, you're still working out the, the details and everything, but uh, um, the trimester, they'll, um, right now it looks, does it look like it's going to be um, conducive to uh, all the different um, programming, such as like foreign languages, if you have a combination of foreign languages or, or um, the music <laughs> program, industrial, what's that? Uh, the music program? Yeah, music program, that's a, yeah, that's another one I was thinking about, yeah. Yeah, and, and so the, probably the majority, we are very well represented on our team, the 15 staff members, and, uh, and when we do this, I'm actually gonna have them here to talk a lot about what was, uh, what was presented. But uh, we, we addressed a lot of the needs of the unique parts of the building. Uh, and uh, some would have me start this September if, they, if we could. Uh, and but some we're going to have to work world languages well, because it's a continuity of learning. There's ways uh, that, in particular, now they're talking to some of those staff and other districts that have made that change and how that's going to work. Uh, we do have a plan for obviously a pretty robust band and choir program. Uh, in that presentation, I showed you what that music block would look like. And we actually have a, a, a set program so students can take band and choir uh, and it doesn't uh, negate other programming for them. So, because that's a big part of who we are. And so we spent a large number of meetings to, uh, to work that. Thank you. Yep. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, we'll let Karen move to the last portion. Um, which is the update on the program plans? Jerry, do you want to? The program plans? Yep. And I'm sorry. That's okay. Should we captured it before that? Uh, and that's okay. And that's actually Ryan's. Ryan's not here tonight. Ryan, at the very last, we, I think we have about five minutes to discuss that. But uh, the, at the district level, they have been working both on the Gifted and Talented and on ELL. Uh, and so we, uh, we ran out of time in our meeting to go into much details. But Ryan has been working with those two departments in particular. And Susan, I'm looking at you. There's a, 
I think those are the two major ones that he was talking about. But um, he has teams that are together working on both of those. Uh, we're looking at what was prism is not going to be gifted and talented. It's a name change for one thing, but uh, but they have, we're looking at that plan and then also the EL program as well too, especially with the new staff coming up. There's a new staff member being hired for EL. Okay. And if there's any questions about those, he can, he can share them. Yep. All righty, and that will push us into new business. And we will invite Tara back to the podium. Uh, discussion and possible action on 66.0301 agreement with Edgerton for the continuation of the cooperative alternative school that we fondly call MECAS. Yes, our MECAS um, alternative school. So every year you need to approve the consortium agreement. This year, Clinton, um, as we suspected, dropped out of the consortium altogether. Um, they have expanded their own alternative programming. So I, we kind of knew that was happening for the last two years. We had one of their students, um, and that was the one spot that they bought, and he graduated this year. So um, they decided not to join the consortium anymore and put, that, put those dollars into their own alternative program. Um, Edgerton is still very happy to be um, with us for this alternative school. Um, they will have the two spots that they've already um, had for the last several years. We are not going to change the name. So it used to be Milton Edgerton Clinton Alternative School. We're changing the C to community, since we do a lot in the community and a lot of community service. It fits nice and we don't have to change any of our um, apparel. <laughs> uh, we also last year, if you remember, we added that 5% administrative fee. So we had never charged an administrative fee to the other districts for being the fiscal agent and having an administrator <coughs> oversee MECAS. Um, so Mary Ellen put that in last year and I think that recouped some of what um, we lost by um, Clinton not having a spot. So we will have 28 of the 30 spots. Edgerton will have two of the 30. Remember also that with the addition of Milton Wired <coughs> under the MECAS umbrella, um, we added some programming there that Edgerton could have a part in and students have here and there used. Um, but that is where those 30 slots are used in both of those programs under MECAS. Any questions about it? I make a motion to approve the 66 colon 0301 agreement with Edgerton for the continuation of the Cooperative Alternative School or MECAS as presented. No second. Motion from Karen, seconded by Mike to approve uh, the motion that Karen just outlined. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion clearly passes. Thank you. Thank you for always supporting my customer. They Thank you. Do Karen. very much appreciate it. Okay. And that puts us up to discussion and possible action on administrative Correct. assistant compensation model. Mr. Shiger, are you going to outline sure. that? What we have here is a compensation model that we developed uh, for the administrative assistants. I believe it was 28 of them. And uh, this was uh, in a response to the, every year we look at a support staff grouping, food service, and the nutrition team, um, the um, buildings and grounds staff, our paraprofessionals in, uh, in the buildings, and our administrative assistants. And we've had this discussion since November uh, at the HR committee, so we've had numerous discussions about this. It was put on hold uh, second semester for various reasons. But in looking at the solution, instead of just looking at uh, raises, we looked at a, a system that would be a little bit more predictable in the future. And what we've come up with is a system similar to what the teacher compensation model uh, is, where we have taken the um, administrative assistance based on their uh, their job classifications and incorporated years of service and we have uh, a proposal in front of you to kind of um, uh, clean up the uh, past practices of inconsistency with uh, hiring standards and, and raises 
and looking at uh, this model which would place people on this grid and then there would be the cells up on top where each year of successful service they would move to in a predictable manner, much like the teacher compensation model. And so what you see in front of you is uh, there's numerous uh, information, pieces of information that compare us to, to districts around us for the various positions. Many districts have different types of positions, very similar, but they may call them something differently. Um, and then we have a, uh, a total. The board approved initially, uh, or in, in the recent past, a 3% increase for all support staff. And what you see in the, in the chart to the far right is the, um, in the blue, the 29,427 is the amount increase based on the 3%. If you add in the, I call it the parachuting of people down onto the grid, that's the red number, the 62,000 one time up front, and then the total cost uh, of it is 91 if you incorporate the 3% that was already factored in by the board. And so then from there you can see where the people are placed, they would move a step to the right upon successful evaluation, uh, but the initial parachute down is listed there and again is based on uh, the type of position they, the uh, admin assistants do. There's a level one, level two, level three, and also it factors in longevity, which is something that has not been uh, consistent in practice moving forward. So for example, there's been some staff that have been hired at a higher rate than some of our staff who have been here for 15 or 20 years. And so this, this is a, a moving forward kind of corrects it. Um, much like we did with the teacher compensation model and then having a predictable budget impact moving forward. And that's, again, this has been a conversation that we've had at the committee level uh, since November. And this is the fruition of that. And we're coming to you and HR committee can speak to this. And we have, if you have any questions, I'm sure Chris can help answer as well. Uh, we come to you seeking for approval of a compensation model and for um, a, a, a group of our staff that are, we believe are well deserving and work hard and support the students and the staff every day. So that's the fruition of that. Okay, have you heard that? Does anyone have questions? I just want to make sure I understand. Uh, so, the uh, administrative assistants um, being support staff, they already received the 3% compensation raise, right? No. No. It was approved by the board, but the uh, new contracts haven't taken place yet. They don't take place until, J or until July. <coughs> we have not given out their letters of employment yet, knowing that this was in the works for the HR committee. And so what you see is the, the combination of the two. Um, which just gives you the, the, the difference in the increase in the budget. I'm giving everyone a chance to peruse it just a bit if they need to. I make a motion that we uh, accept the administrative assistance compensation model as presented. I'll second. <clears throat> motion from Tom, seconded by Rick, as you just heard, to accept the uh, compensation model that has been presented to us. Any further discussion? Yeah, I guess I um, kind of have to agree with um, an opinion that was presented at, at the uh, um, um, public participation and, and that um, um, I, would, I guess I'd like to see the some you know the new superintendent actually come up and, and and decide what the pay structure should be for those administrative assistants I mean I, they're they're looking at the uh, um, pay and competitive uh, where they are competitively in the marketplace and there's a lot that are um, definitely probably need um, to be moved up, but there are also some that are way up there as well. So um, I guess I'm, I'm still 
not sure if this is the right way to do it. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, the new superintendent should be the one that decides. But that's just my own personal comment. Anyone else? One of the things I really like about the structure is that um, it establishes ranges for the different levels that we have, which we didn't really have established before to match on what those job titles were doing in those three different levels. Um, and where some of the people, or some of the positions currently do fall on the higher end, a lot of them are well under a mark comparison, some of which they're the very lowest ranked amongst our competitor or um, our people in our district or conferences and when you have a range it's nice that then when we have to refill a position it gives us a starting point and any point based on, on experience into that position um, a lot of this is about market adjustment not about and that also matching to what your level is I think it's less about who the superintendent is, it's more about the jobs that are actually being performed by the individuals in those positions. And for a budget um, standpoint, that is very, uh, we know what it's gonna be next year because of the, the model. And it's also good for the individuals, they know what they're gonna be next year. So there's, it's a plus plus right there. And piggybacking off that, um, even with the finance kind of committee level lens, when I was looking at it, this year we have a, a pretty significant adjustment because this this grouping hasn't been reevaluated in a couple of years, so there's some that definitely need some adjustments. Um, but moving forward, if you looked at if we gave that standard three percent or somewhere in that range, um, we actually should be forecasted to save a significant amount of money um, based on how it's looming. Um, in those different tiers. <clears throat> so it kind of gives us ability when we're looking at the budget to be a little more proactive in planning and have an understanding. Anyone else? Uh, hearing none, we will proceed to vote and I will roll call this one also. And I will flip to the other end of my table and we'll ask Brian to go first. No. Mike? Yes. Karen? Yes. Joe is yes. Tom? Yes. Rick? Yes. Diamond? Yes. Six to one, that motion clearly passes. Cool. Okay. Um, next on our agenda, it says discussion and possible action on results of Baker Tilly audit. And uh, we shared out with you folks the summary of that that has uh, come to us since our last meeting and it isn't demanding action it's just on here as a discussion point um, I think just to refresh all of you we we charged Baker Tilly with uh, helping us look into the past and in general terms to uh, sort of record and, and uh, confirm our use of stipends in the district and to that effect uh, they did that for us and that is summarized on the spreadsheet that you have and the reason for that and uh, I'll ask uh, Shana Lewis to correct me if I'm wrong basically we need to know what to do next I think is what Baker Tilly is asking us that's why it's on your agenda and why we have it as a discussion item if we need clarification if we've got questions or uh, basically we sort of need to pick a path here for what we're going to do with this and at that I will stop and let the discussion center on what you have for information in front of you. Joe, could I add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So I just want to remind you guys that in Lori Lubinsky's March 4th, 2019 investigative report, she had a footnote that was pretty important. And the footnote read, the extent of the use of stipends over the last two school years depends on what amounts are included in the category of stipends. Reports that were generated for purposes of this investigation show total payouts for the 2015-16 school year of 568,000, approximately 2016-17. She goes on to identify the amounts for the various years. And she says, unfortunately though, 
these reports include payments such as pto and vacation payouts cell phone stipends for staff and other payments such as department head payments unfortunately absent going through every entry in these reports and cross-referencing these reports with other records to ascertain the reasons for each payment it is impossible to ascertain the extent of stipends used to compensate employees for extra work based on that footnote then you authorize the hiring of baker tilly in order to take the following actions to obtain general ledger detail for fiscal years ended june 30th 2011 through june 30th 2019 for all stipend accounts used by the district if nine years of data is not available obtain as many years as is analyzed by year account and purpose the activity posted to each stipend account and then provide the district with summarized analysis by year of purposes for which stipend account was used and a recommendation of appropriate wisconsin uniform financial accounting requirements or rufar accounts that should have been used so where we are at this point is you have in front of you the year-by-year -year analysis of what has been categorized as quote stipends by your administration as it relates to lori's the information provided to to lori for her investigative report and now that same information that's been provided to wendy unger of baker tilly you have then in front of you that summary report which indicates that the stipends were used for a variety of items that lori identified and specified specifically what uh, categories and how much per category so you have um, the mentor program payments you have coaching club advisor payments and they're divvied up by the appendices number you have a homeroom coordinator a lead teacher a prism gifted and talented coordinator you have board of education stipend you have coaching um, additional coaching prior to 2014-15 accounts you have extra duties as assigned you have the payout of personal time off you have a, a phone stipend you have multi-use summer school principal etc um, provisions you have vacation payout you have an eye guide program that has since been eliminated and then again coaching um, prior to 2014-15 and then you have all of the numbers associated with each of those identified per year at this point now the question is is what do you want to do with this information as a board the plan was as i understood it was to get an idea as to how much was classified as quote a stipend in your accounts and then determine which uh, of the accounts should be identified by other names so as to avoid the misinformation that has been um, presented that has been repeated that somehow there's a use of stipends for all sorts of improper purposes and so perhaps at this point you as a board would like to refer this project to a committee the hr committee or the finance uh, finance committee or a combination of both might be a good idea so that they can then come to the board with a proposal about how to tackle this moving forward in your accounting practices mr thank you for that clarification that was much more eloquent than i could have come up with so what's your pleasure fellow board members what should we do with the information we got um, well, I guess the first thing I'd like to do is um, just do some data validation uh, because when I see some things that doesn't really kind of jive, I, either I have a misunderstanding or maybe the data isn't correct. Um, so this is all the stipends. Um, what about, is there, a, was there a, like, let's take phone stipend for example. I'm sorry, what, take what? The phone stipend. Phone. Okay. Um, does this amount include the phone stipend as it's uh, as it was categorized as a phone stipend and is there a, like a separate phone account and the reason why i'm asking this is because if you look at um the the amounts for the last four years well this year um it's obviously year to date uh but um if you take a look at uh, the previous three years, um, it really hasn't changed. 
And my understanding is that was supposed to change because um, uh, the administrators were going to get that phone stipend put into their regular pay, in which case you would expect at least uh, 2018, 19, that year to, to actually decrease, and it doesn't look like it has. So I'm wondering, so I'm just trying to do some data validation and, and seeing whether or not there was something missing or if, if I'm misunderstanding something. It looks like it was cut in half from 2000 fiscal year 2018 to fiscal year 2019. So that to me is a substantial change. So fiscal year 2019 today, uh, that's different than our calendar year then? Uh, so that's, are you saying that's from? Um, but we don't evaluate these on a calendar year. We evaluate them based on July to June, your fiscal year. So fiscal year sure. 2019 would end June of 2019. Okay. So that again, reveals right. to me a substantial yeah. change in no, the no, and that's why I asked yeah. because I wanted to make sure I, it, it, you know was it my misunderstanding or is it something else so, so that's good that's good uh, and then the other one is um, when you take a look at the stipend special um, for I guess I guess it would be fiscal year 2019 uh, get back there uh, it says twenty thousand uh, forty one dollars um, I'm assuming that doesn't include the stipends for, for uh, Dr. Scheiger, uh, Dr. Schutz, and Mr. Bubian that uh, were given out um, in November? Those were not categorized by your, your business department as stipend special in that quote account. So that- I mean, No one was, but yeah, you're right. No, it wasn't, it was not for this purpose. Okay. Was that the only ones that weren't categorized? I, I can't answer that question. I don't know that, that you're asking True. me to, to say <laughs> like the negative of something. I'm not the one who reviewed all of these accounts. Yeah, yeah. If I'm you sorry. look at yeah. the guide that, that Wendy put together, the stipend special includes those multi-use stipends, summer school principal, snow day work, other duties or extra work assigned stipend, flat rate stipend for prom, musical, things like that. We can certainly ask her to elaborate further on what the what is included in that specific entry. Um, you guys specifically talked about wanting this in a summary form when it was presented to you, as opposed to you know kind of digging into the hundreds and hundreds of entries of, of accounting um, files that that Wendy would have had to have gone through. So I can certainly ask for that if that's something that the board wishes to have elaborated on. Um, no, I was just trying to make sure that, you know, validate the data and everything, but uh, one thing I want to make sure I, write, I capture here is you said, like, for the fiscal year uh, 2019, the fiscal year started July 1st, 2018? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's all the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's your pleasure, board? What are we doing? I think it would be a good idea for the for finance and the HR committee to um, look at this and see uh, where we want to go with it. There's a lot of information there, and uh, maybe we could have uh, Baker Tilly come to uh, our joint meeting, committee meeting, and explain maybe in a little more detail, be able to answer some questions that we may have. But I would guess that would be our next step. So, I, be appropriate. I would suggest that we just uh, keep it at the finance committee level. Um, if you, if you do the finance in the, in the HR committee level, then you might as well just do the full board, because I think it's pretty much the full board. Right, there's overlap. The finance committee is made up of Mike Diamond and Joe. HR is Tom Diamond and Mike. So really, the only two you're adding are Joe and Mike. Right. But I... Yeah. Well, in that case, I... I I, think I would the, recommend the full board then. I, I would agree with you. That would be my recommendation is that the full board take a look at this. We can certainly have Wendy uh, plan to come in an upcoming board meeting. I don't know what her schedule is, but just a reminder that EMC paid for this summary study, this, this investigative process, and would in fact pay for her to attend a meeting as well. So that would not be an additional cost to the district. Put that in the form of a motion for me. 
to our next step. Do we need a motion? Or just <laughs> oh, just so you know, we'll look. I make a motion that we just have the whole board look at it and have the Kelly come up with us. Get started. Second. Motion from Mike, second from Brian to have uh, Baker Tilly come and address the entire board um, relative to what we're going to uh, do with our summary schedule here of stipend use in the district. Any other discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? That is what we'll do. We'll reach out to Baker Tilly and invite them to our next opportunity. Okay, here. And last on new business, and this says discussion on open records requests. And this has my name on it, so I will start the discussion. But uh, it is merely on here to trigger responses from all of you. Um, just wanted to make folks aware of the, uh, the, the, the process or our practice of open records requesting. Um, I think most of you are aware that it's a means by which anyone can get information from the district about uh, records, public records that we are bound to keep and disclose as needed. Um, it has become a bit problematic in, uh, in the cumulative effect. Uh, the records requests have uh, added up a little, if you will, such that um, they are causing a tremendous burden on our staff at district level. Um, we are a little short staffed at district office as you are aware so there are fewer shoulders still uh, bearing the burden of these open record requests so while we have great folks up there that are doing their very very best I want the board specifically and the community in general to know that you know we certainly are compelled and willing to uh, meet and honor all these record requests but they come at a considerable cost we have a lot of staff time involved. Um, and quite frankly, that's pulling our folks away from doing the stuff that we need them to do. Uh, the other component that I'll share with you is the legal bills relative to open record requests since the 1st of January that the district is paying slash taxpayers $16,000. Now those are not costs that we can recoup on any of the requesters. Those are costs that we have to bear, and we will. But in the community, I want you aware of what that cost is. And there are, to my knowledge, at least seven open record requests pending. They will take more staff time and more legal investigation and augmentation. And we will certainly continue to do what we've been doing, but I want the rest of the board aware and I want their opinions on open record requests in general. So I will stop and see if anyone else has anything they want to add. So uh, Joe, a uh, couple things. Um, um, you might have to explain why there's uh, additional legal fees for open record requests. Um, a lot of times, the open record request is just between the uh, um, between the uh, custodian and the requester. Um, I'm not sure why they all go through the legal channel. Um, but on top of that, I should let you be aware that our, our, it looks like our policy is outdated. Um, the the part that you had highlighted. Um, mentions 25% uh, per page charge, assuming that's uh, a hard copy. Um, I believe there isn't um, an actual charge for per page if it's a, a digital copy if that's requested. But the other thing that's uh, in here is that um, in calculating location costs, the district will use the applicable uh, employee's hourly rate for salary and benefits. And uh, the uh, Office of Open Government has uh, sent out an advisory of uh, August 8th, uh, 2018, that talks about charging fees, um, and it's directed to custodians uh, with, throughout Wisconsin. 
in which it, it says, as a general rule, the rate of an actual necessary and direct charge for staff time should be based on the pay rate of the lowest paid employee capable of performing the task. Um, they also put in there, and I don't think a whole lot of people um, are asking for hard copies anymore, but uh, the DOJ's actual cost for a copy, a black and white copy is uh, uh, 1.35 cents, and for a color copy it's uh, 6.32 cents, and, and they use that as a guideline. Uh, so um, I just want to kind of bring that up that uh, we may have to update our policy to, to ensure that uh, the, the fees that we're charging is um, complies with the direction of, of the uh, Attorney General. Joe, so I'd be happy to take um, Brian's question with regard to the legal fees as well as the costs. Please do. So with regard to public records requests, the school district has an obligation to both the public under the public records law as well as the record subjects, the people about whom the records pertain. It is possible for a governmental entity to be sued by an individual whose record is disclosed without following the specific procedures of notice as well as without, um, without considering the specific impact on those, uh, those, empl those employees or other record subjects. The school district or other governmental entity may also be sued by the requester if the school district does not process the public records request in a man manner that is consistent with the law. As a result, many school districts, including yours, utilize legal assistance in reviewing the public records requests and preparing the specific notices and the requester response letters that have very specific requirements that identify the basis for withholding or redacting information, as well as notice to the requester that any withholding or redacting of information is subject to review by the attorney general or the district attorney. As a result of those legal obligations and potential litigation arising out of public records requests, comprehensive or complex public records requests are typically not handled just by the school district or other governmental entity, but are in fact, uh, there is consultation with legal counsel in order to ensure that the school district is not uh, disclosing a record that is going to cause them litigation or that is that the school district is not withholding a record or information that will cause them litigation. So that's why your school district utilizes, utilizes legal counsel. Yeah, okay. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't utilize uh, legal counsel in all cases, but I'm also suggesting that we don't utilize legal counsel for every case because that's not what school districts do. Your school district is not utilizing legal counsel for every public records request. They are utilizing legal counsel for the complex or comprehensive requests that have come in recently that's for that's numerous right. documents, emails, other correspondence. And as you all know, you all get requests from us because not only are you utilizing your district provided devices and email accounts, but you are also utilizing your personal devices and email accounts, which even makes more uh, of a, a difficult situation in responding to public records requests. So it is a very complex area of the law. You guys are doing what you need to do in order to make sure that you're protecting the taxpayers, that you are being responsive to the requesters, and also that you are, are being responsible records custodians. Yeah, and that's fine. I'm just making sure that we're not using uh, legal counsel for every single one because that would be inappropriate. You are not using legal counsel for every single public records request, I promise you that. Um, with regard to your questions or comments with regard to your policy needing to be updated, the August 2018 advisory opinion that came out of the Attorney General's office certainly presented some information that school districts and other governmental entities should consider with regard to charging fees for photocopies, both black and white and color, and with regard to charging for location costs. You may want to review the, the amount that you are charging per page, although I don't believe that at this point, um, with regard to any of the, the public records requests that I've worked on, that, that you have charged any photocopying costs. With regard to the location costs, you are utilizing the lowest paid individual who is capable or authorized to conduct the, the location or searches for the records 
that are responsive to the request. You've always done that. The August 2018 opinion from the Attorney General was not news to me or to anyone who practices in the area of school or municipal law, and we've been providing you with that advice from the very beginning. In fact, Chris and I, Chris Tukendorf and I have had many conversations, and Ed Snow and I have had many conversations, and Tim Scheiger and I have had many conversations about which employees specifically can conduct the location tasks in order to make sure that we are in fact not charging anything that would be excessive or not in compliance with the law. Yeah, my point was that the uh, policy had to be uh, changed, not that the district was doing anything right or wrong, because the uh, policy specifically says the applicable employees, it should state, it should be more uh, clear and concise and, and, um, and match or correspond with what the general, uh, the Attorney General's opinion is. I would that's, be careful, that's my yeah, and I would be point. careful about making changing your policy in order to correspond with an advisory opinion from the attorney general because technically speaking it's not legal precedence a court could come in tomorrow and reject the advisory opinion of an attorney general so it's my understanding that your policy matches the statute which is exactly what you need to be following is what the statute requires thank you Okay, this is not an action item, it's only for discussion. Anybody else have any thoughts I have, otherwise? I have a question. So, um, we have a lot right now that's pending, it sounds. Um, could you, if you guesstimate, educationally guesstimate, um, how much time district employees have allocated towards open records requests in January that they're not spending on? Their daily tasks. It, it's dozens of hours. I don't have it calculated out. Um, you know, we have numerous pending ones that we're working on, um, and of course now with the reduction of or the change of employees, and the, the people who do the open records requests, myself, Terry, Ed, um, are gone, and uh, and with those who might have been capable, some of our upper level. Uh, district employees are either on vacation or um, aren't available. And so uh, I do know that the hiring process is going on right now as well. And so um, I know Chris has been working with the staff to get as much of this done as possible. I know that's also putting some pressure on the principals who are trying to hire the best quality um, staff that are out there. We're not getting those hirings done and we can't do both right now at the same time. And so we probably you know, we, we, I think we have lost out on a couple of people that potentially would be coming here. Um, it's definitely a burden, um, but I think that, um, that the board would maybe consider um, how to address these staffing wise in the future. Um, you know, the communications position doesn't fall into that person's position. If you uh, bring that position back, um, do you look at someone who's, I mean, right now it's almost, it's, it's minimum a half-time job uh, just to fill these requests for the next two months probably. So it's, uh, it's daunting, and, and remember it's also the end of the year. Uh, all of the requirements for our, our budget auditing, for our staffing reports, for our compliance reports through uh, title and through uh, student services, are, are coming due at the end of the month, and uh, and then the, the audit shortly thereafter for those various departments. And so, it's a uh, while we are diligent and trying the best we can, we have some, as uh, Shanna had said, that are needing special attention. And when you're talking about uh, looking at asking for emails and etc., and especially when it comes to board member items, I mean that's tens of thousands of emails that have to be gone through. And uh, while it may seem like an easy request, um, and there have been some easy ones that we respond to within a day or two, uh, but when you're talking about going through all of your emails as a board, that's weeks. Uh, and while they still, while the staffing, that the staff that are working on them have their full-time jobs as well. And so we're, again, we're trying to manage through it. We are chipping away at it, but it is taking an, an, an highly uh, unusual amount of time as well as expenses. So I, the thing that concerns me, Joe, 
and um, I guess you know when, when this this uh, item came up and I looked at it and I see the the, um, the particular item on the uh, policy I highlighted okay I get you know we probably need to charge if you know for the reasonable costs and everything but the fact that it's coming up and, and we have to have a special agenda item on here it almost seems like we're trying to um, um, dis uh, dissuade if that's a word <laughs> um, try to uh, you know prevent people or try to convince people not to put uh, ask for information which is their legal right to to ask for that information so why we're talking about well this is so much of a burden and this is so much costing us so much money well guess what that's our responsibility that's what we're supposed to be doing it's the public's right to do that and it just seems um and maybe maybe i'm reading this wrong but it just seems to me that um we're trying to um as having this on here trying to uh, convince people not to seek information when we should be asking them is to, you know, seek all the information they can and try to be transparent. This is, to me, it, it almost seems like we're trying not to be transparent. I guess, I just guess I really have a problem with the way this conversation's gone, and maybe I'm misunderstanding people here, but uh, to me it just doesn't seem right. I think that the point is to provide an explanation so when you get uh, emails from the requesters as to why are they not getting the information in a timely manner, it's a, it's a daunting task, Brian. And when you're talking about going through tens of thousands then of emails, why are we talking about how much it costs? I think that's important for the for people to know that there is a cost associated with an open. Yeah, but we can charge that. them what the reasonable cost is. It, it's it, it's it's immaterial what it is. Right. It's it is it is their right to to get that information well, regardless I, of what it costs the district. I don't think anyone's arguing that it's not, but the taxpayers often have brought up different things that the district spends money on or, or where money goes. So I think a lot of people that I've talked to that have asked me about it, one of the questions they do ask is all of, you know, there's a lot more rumors I think about open records requests because not everyone's always in the know. I think even as board members, I don't know every open record request that exists right now or the extent of how much work goes into each one, nor do I know the cost that's associated with open each open records request that we have. But I have the thought that they're starting to add up and as a taxpayer well, what does that up. look like let them add up you know what this is this, this is the up, cost of doing okay business this is a requirement we have this is a requirement this is a cost of doing business we don't have a, a choice of do it or don't do it and no we way have way to do it too, but i don't think it's wrong to associate the cost that goes with that well as monetary wise of what our resources are costing but also the opportunity of what we're giving up in terms of our staff and what they should be doing for the district. It's it's immaterial because we have to do it. And, and quite honestly, if we were more tra transparent up in the beginning, we probably wouldn't have all these requests. Hey Brian, may I speak um, about what I've taken over as of June 12th? Yeah. Um, so Jerry handed off the open records request and the process to me on June 12th. And I've been working with um, the members of the media that have requested those. So it's uh, keeping in communication with them. We have spreadsheets that track them. And uh, like Tim mentioned, we have some that have been filled within the day off. And um, I have no intention, and nobody's told me, not to fill them. So we are going through and we're going to be processing them. And it just it's going to take just a tad bit of time because we're trying to balance out hiring people and filling those requests too. And uh, some of them are in tens of thousands of emails that have come in and the requests may seem simple on the front end but it's all of the details behind that so absolutely uh, from an hr standpoint from the hr department definitely uh, ready to take that challenge on and do what i can to help out um, and I, I would think that um, i can speak for you joe but just letting you know we're ready to do that and uh, happy to do it thank you chris I would add, Brian, that uh, I put it on the agenda not so much from the cost standpoint because, as I alluded to earlier, the, the vast majority of the costs incurred so far are not recoverable from the request board. So it's not a cost-driven thing. I wanted 
the focus and the discussion on the cumulative effect of the time demand on a short-staffed administrative yeah. office. I guess I don't understand the intent of that, Joe, because to me, when you say that, to me, the intent is look at all the effort we have to spend. We have to spend all this time doing these this responsibility that we're obligated to do. Um, maybe we've short-staffed, but we have to do all this stuff, so please don't send in your open records request. That's kind of what it, how it's reading, at least to the public, to me, and possibly to many people in the public, and I, I just don't, I just have a problem with that. I mean, if people want to request an open record, they should, they should be, and we shouldn't dissuade them. And Brian, when it comes to charging, we've only had one uh, open records request from January till I took over on June 12th that we've charged for. Right. So I'm trying to put some, uh, things in place, working with Shana and Tim on what does that process look like, creating invoices, working with Wendy in our business office, because I will be issuing um, invoices for that location cost. And like you and Shana had said, it's based off of who is able to do that piece, the least expensive individual. Yeah. Okay. So Thanks that's me come. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, I guess everyone's had a chance to weigh in. That's not an action item, that was just a FYI. That will push us up to miscellaneous. And first on that is action on staffing report. Which you have in front of you. I make a motion that we accept the staffing report as it is presented to us. Yeah. Motion from Karen, seconded by Diamond, to accept the staffing report as you see in front of you. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. That motion passes. Action on gifts and donations. Make a motion to accept it. Accept the gifts and donations with uh, gratitude. Second. Motion from Mike, seconded by Diamond, to accept the gifts and donations with the gratitude of the district as per usual. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion also clearly passes. Uh, upcoming board and committee meetings. The Benefits Advisory Group coming in the subcommittee is uh, July 12th at 10 o'clock in the district office in the TDC. And then July 15th is the school board meeting. It's the only one for July at 6.30 here in the LMC. And there's only two that are set up at this point. We have meeting Okay, now we have our segue into our closed session. And I will entertain a motion after I read the disclaimer. Bear with me, it has a lot to it this time. Motion to go into executive session of state statute 19.85, parent ones and parents C, E, F, and G, considering employment, promotion, compensation, and performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. Deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting of other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. Considering financial, <coughs> medical, social, or personal histories or disciplinary data of specific persons. Preliminary consideration of specific personnel problems or the investigation of charges against specific persons except where parent B applies which, if discussed in public, would be likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data, or involved in such problems or investigations, conferring with legal counsel for the governmental body who is rendering oral or written advice concerning strategy to be adopted by the body with respect to litigation in which it is or is likely to become involved. We will be discussing interim superintendent contract, administrator paid off, take time off conversion, personnel investigation request, and potential future litigations. After that giant mouthful. So Second. Motion from Tom, seconded by Karen. 
Roll call, back to my left. Diamond. Yes. Rick. Yes. Tom. Yes. Joe is yes. Karen. Yes. Mike. Yes. And Brian. No. Six to one, that motion passes. We are in executive session. Oh,